going to uh, do introductions, and the first person that I'd like to introduce you to is Carol Van Hook Weaver of Acara Partners, and I'm going to ask Carol to introduce herself, tell us about your role at Acara and, and about Acara itself, because you, you're doing some pretty unique stuff. Well, thank you for that. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody uh, had fun in Louisville. I'm actually born and raised in Lexington, which is about an hour from here, so I'm glad not to have to hop on a plane for a conference, but um, this is great. Uh, but no, my name is Carol Van Hook. I'm the leasing and marketing director with Acara Partners. We're based out of Chicago. I travel all over the United States. I've been helping launch a brand from the ground up called Connect. And Connect is a social club with apartments and co-working built for the traveling professional and that, um, that want to be in city, that are city dwellers and they want a flexible lifestyle on demand. So uh, that's kind of the elevator pitch of our brand that we're developing, but there's uh, about five different business models under one roof. Um, I kind of call it a cruise ship on land. So not only do we have the apartment side, um, more of the micro living lifestyle um, with a furnished and a co-living aspect, but we have an entire co-working floor and a co-working product um, similar to your industriouses, we work novels, things like that, but we're managing it in our own house and monetizing on all of this co-working space and amenity spaces. And last but not least, we're a full-blown social club. So, um, I mean, hence our word, uh, our brand Connect, right? So uh, we have um, fitness classes weekly, we have engaging classes, networking, uh, mixology classes. So there's something that people can pack their schedules with um, to really meet people in these cities. Um, because we are building in the top 30 cities. So right now we are operational in Nashville, um, right on Music Row, it's awesome. Um, and then we are also in downtown Phoenix as well, um, which I can't wait to see you guys at the Phoenix conference. Um, but that's my role with the company is starting everything from the ground up. So um, finding the leasing spaces, hiring the teams, training the teams, um, getting in these markets where people don't know who we are and making sure everybody knows who we are. Um, so they sign leases and move in. That's my job. <laughs> and because they're doing such unique stuff with their shared spaces, we couldn't keep her on just a single panel. So you'll have to hear Carol again at lunchtime and we'll expand the topic a little bit to see some of the other things that they're doing. Okay, next up, Marshall. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think I met several of you in boardrooms yesterday. My name is Marshall Friday. I lead ADT's multifamily division. So a lot of people recognize the name ADT right away as uh, the home security company. Of course, every time you turn on your TV, Property Brothers are talking about home security. So it's very difficult uh, as I travel city to city talking about ADT multifamily away from that brand that everyone's familiar with for the last 150 years. Our multifamily division, though, uh, focuses on smart technology for apartment companies. Uh, we sell things like smart locks, smart thermostats, smart light switches, leak detectors uh, into smart apartment complexes. Uh, I have a little bit different introduction than Carol did because today is actually my wife's birthday. So I'm going to film a video of all of you if you're willing to participate saying happy birthday to my wife uh, so I can send her something that she's never done before. Uh, and she knows that I'm actually at work today instead of just traveling to Louisville to hang out with all my friends. So uh, Yes. Yes. Well... Before we do that, I heard everybody kind of went out last night and I didn't get to. Um, so I think we should have a little hair of the dog with some Kentucky bourbon. You guys want to join me? I think that's a great idea, yep. Marshall. But this you guys didn't expect this at 8 a.m. at a breakfast meeting, did you? First panel of the day started right. All right, should we do the selfie? We made yeah, All right, everybody say happy birthday. So my wife's name is Delisi. If you watched Game of Thrones, there was Khaleesi on there. Her name is Delisi. So if you could say happy birthday, Delisi, I'm sure it'll make her day. <gasps> So, one, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Delisi! Woo! All right, cheers. Here we cheers. go. Cheers. All right. Whew. Thank y'all. Let's do this. <laughs> Way to start the oh, day. Oh, right? I may learn something about <laughs> being a moderator today. We'll oh, see man. how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Taylor, if you'd oh. like to introduce yourself. <laughs> to all following front. that is going to be rough, but uh, I, did, I did meet several of you guys yesterday. Uh, in a couple of boardroom sessions, ADT invited me here. But uh, my name is Taylor Whitaker. I'm the founder and CEO of Innovative NOI. Um, and actually, prior to this, I was the head of innovation at both BH Management and Alliance Residential Company. So uh, after kind of being in that decision-making seat, I realized what a need there was for the entire industry to have kind of a translation of the value of prop tech 
So that's really what Innovative NOI is. We offer consultation services. We represent a little over 64,000 units currently, our client base. Um, and over the past year, we've been able to shave over nine months off the 14-month decision-making cycle that's typically associated when you guys are looking at all the different vendors in the space and uh, running pilots and trying to understand the value of uh, a lot of these prop tech solutions. So, um, you know, fortunately, you know, you don't have to spend tons of money anymore. You don't have to, you know, pilot after pilot after pilot um, just to figure out that uh, one specific vendor is your favorite. Uh, what's the point, right? You're, you're wasting good, good revenue. Um, a lot of time, a lot of uh, resources, and really dedication just to get to a decision. So we're here to help you get to that decision much quicker. Um, and we actually have a, a proprietary AI that leverages market data from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics to cap rates to everything. Um, and we're looking at all the intangibles. But uh, I'll actually be demoing it in that boardroom session. So if you're curious, uh, definitely check it out. But uh, I look forward to meeting with you guys later. Thanks. So we've got a good mix here. We, we have the opportunity to be able to hear from someone who is deploying technology within their units. We've got a vendor who's all about technology, and then we've got someone who's in between who's working both with the vendors and with the operators to help analyze and quantify the benefits that are coming from technology. So to kick off the discussion today, really any time that we want to introduce newer technology into our properties, the easiest way is to be able to have a really solid return on investment use case, right? And the last two years, particularly with the pandemic, have changed a lot of things, not just in this industry, but across all industries. And, and I wanna start there, is what are some things that have taken place over the last two years, technologies that have been introduced, introduced perhaps out of necessity due to the pandemic. And I'm going to uh, have Carol kick us off here. So, Carol, what are some things you've seen deployed over that time frame that have helped you at Acara, um, particularly in reducing costs and increasing efficiency? Sure. Well, a big part of our product already is having furnished apartments because we're catering to that traveling professional. So when we first launched, we had about 60% of our properties furnished. Once we started the lease up um, during the pandemic in Nashville, um, 500 units, um, and then also about 300 additional co-working members that we could have, uh, the demand that we just found from people, the great migration from California and the Northwestern states, the, the demand was for furnished apartments. So I went back to my awesome developers and I had to break down everything and we actually had to make another furniture order. So now with that behavior that we tracked, we are now 80% furnished at, at, at all of our connect properties going forward. Um, so we're about to break ground in Denver. Um, we have properties in uh, uh, land in Cleveland and Minneapolis. So that's gonna be kind of our, our standard now, our brand standard is 80% furnished and then having some unfurnished um, apartments as well. Um, now, when people are looking online, we're super transparent about our pricing. We really don't pay attention to square footage because you're getting a co-working membership. You're getting a furnished apartment. You, there's so many conveniences all under one roof. So, But when people look online and they compare a furnished versus unfurnished, our price point is literally under 250 bucks to go ahead and get a furnished apartment. So when I'm selling it, when I'm training my teams and we're touring, and I'm like, look for a studio and your bed's gonna be out the whole time, you could go ahead and get one of our furnished studios, which is most of our product, is this the studio life that we're selling. Um, and people are like, that's a no brainer because you have an electronic Murphy bed, a hideaway desk, your built in armoire, like everything's there and it transforms your space and you just don't have to worry about it. So that's been a big thing for us is like actually um, learning from our behavior is like increasing the furniture, the furnished uh, packages. Um, we also uh, partnered with Nexodus. That's our co-working software. I know in multifam, we've all we all want to monetize on all of our business spaces, and this is already planned in our on our business model. Before, I mean, we've been developing Connect since 2011. This concept, so. It just happens that it happened during the pandemic and we have all this co-working space, but it's been product, part of the product the entire time. Um, so partnering with, co with our co-working software Nexodus, 
we are now able to plug in anything we want to charge for. So we can plug in day passes for the pool. In Nashville, we're charging $100 a day pass to use our pool because it's awesome. And people are going to pay that. Um, we're charging to use our podcast um, studio. That's um, 75 bucks an hour. So using that software has also increased in insane NOI um, because we're able to plug in different monetization revenue streams um, right through that software in our Stripe program. Um, so we can just create anything that we want to charge for and people are wanting to rent spaces to make social media content. We had JBL speakers uh, film their Christmas commercial there. Um, Vanderbilt rented out our amenity deck for like a Walker Hayes music video kind of thing. So that was cool. Um, so we're really finding this co-working software where you can monetize and plug in your different revenue streams um, to make money on all of your spaces that are typically sitting there empty. Um, one last thing, and I'll, and I'll turn it back over. I could talk all, all day for this, but... Going to um, during the pandemic was having to pivot during a lease up and hard hat tours to figure out how to get people on the damn property because we couldn't take anybody on the property. And that's right. where I had my little show model. So, of course, we went to the video tours and we enhanced our LCP um, virtual staging with our co-working so people could really walk through um, the LCP tours. Um, love that company. They're really great to work with. And they also enhance your I still call it Google My Business, but I think it's GBP now, Google Business Profile. Um, so they they really enhance those video walkthroughs as well. I think it's a great price. Um, and we just have can have these virtual links wherever we go. Um, and then creating that video component of that face-to-face. -face. So Vidyard um, is a huge component. We'll show videos here shortly. Um, but this has really tracked our, we get all the analytics on our videos. Um, and we created um, different videos of walkthroughs that people can literally walk through the apartment. So if you want to show this, the studio walkthrough. There you go, it's going. You want to walk us through up here? Yeah, so um, just doing little video walkthroughs. This is an app called Vidyard, and it's similar to Loom or Real Link. Um, you know, and actually I got a video from Little Bird before I came here, I loved it. Um, but you get all the analytics, and you can see how long they watched it, who watched it, where they watched it from, um, and then you can follow up with that person. Um, and so we made videos on just about everything. Um, this is actually the Phoenix property um, of our little studios with our furniture package. Um, and then we did maintenance videos, we answered FAQs. So really during the pandemic to help close those leases faster and make that human connection, I really went to video. And my little staff, I mean, they're all born with phones in their hands, so they're fine on video. <laughs> so, the, so the showing, so obviously you would have been able to reduce some costs in terms of how you were staffing your showing yes. um, process. Right, because we didn't, we could just send video links and we could answer questions in real time. And um, some of our staff had to work from home. And so they were able to respond quickly um, and, and call back those prospects. So taking this technology, how are you able to then also deploy this from a like service and maintenance point of view? So not only are we using it for building that rapport and relationship with our prospects, is that we have a lot of international clients as well in these, in these big cities. And we're all used to dealing with international, but um, having these videos, I mean, not everybody knows how to work the shower. Um, we have the ventless uh, washers and dryers with Whirlpool. Not, not everybody knows you have to like empty the water to, to do your dryer. So with all these FAQs and questions all the time and our maintenance guys are so busy, um, we were just like, let's make a video library. And so, um, and you'll see some of the videos here of our maintenance guys, you know, getting them on camera and making these little videos. Um, but everyone's watching them and it reduces the FAQ. Hey guys, if you ever find yourself in the situation of some... Well, go ahead. Nine yeah. times out of 10, the GFCI outlet. Uh, this one's located in the kitchen. As you can see, there's a red light on it. Um, all you gotta do is press this reset button. That outlet will work again. And if that doesn't work, it usually means when your breakers are tripped, there's a breaker located in the bedroom. All you gotta do is flip that one over. Got one more example here. Hey guys, this is the facilities director at Connect Phoenix. I'm gonna show you what to time. do if your clothes get stuck in your washer. So first things first, there's a little tab over here on the right side. This piece is located at the bottom of your, of your washer. There's a tab on the right side. All you can do is push that tab in, pull it down, and pull up, and that panel will come off. And then this piece right here, you can get a, a small flathead screwdriver, pull it down. Sometimes you can even do it with your finger. Pull it down, door opens. 
I can't tell you how many work orders that reduced because people just couldn't, you know, putting in a work order because their clothes are stuck in their washer. We made a video of it, send it out, boom, you know, and the maintenance guys can go on and do whatever they need to do. So just trying to work smarter, not harder. And if we're doing the same thing over and over again, make a video about it and, and get it out to your, to your residents and prospects. Awesome. Okay, Marshall, uh, ADT has been around for over 100 years traditionally been in electronic security, but over the last decade or two have, have certainly expanded into other services like smart home services, recently solar as well. Uh, can you tell us about some of the key areas where you've seen deployment uh, of your solution that helps reduce costs? First of all, I, I just found out today that there are electronic Murphy beds. That sounds sweet to yeah, have with something a remote, that, no. that, that just completely opens up the room uh, from a bed perspective. Uh, so reduction in cost, uh, all of our customers talk to us about two things. It's number one, increasing revenue, and number two, reducing cost. And it's very interesting. Uh, obviously, we went to market as a smart home company that was all about revenue. But the cost reduction that we've heard from some of our clients has been nothing short of outstanding, right? The, the first thing that we heard from folks is rekeying cost money. And it's not to say that smart locks are free and, and you immediately gain all of that cost back from rekeying. But with a, a smart lock, for example, when you start to add technology into your portfolio, uh, rekeying is now moving somebody from occupied to vacant in Yardy or RealPage and moving the next resident uh, and, and creating that unit as occupied again. The key is now on their phone. Everyone has access to it. Uh, and the minute they move in, they have access. The minute they move out, they lose access. So huge cost savings there. The second piece of cost savings comes from uh, utilities. So the primary example that we talk to is um, air conditioning, heating. Uh, depending on which market you're in and, and which side of the, the HVAC you're using, whether it's heating or cooling, uh, we have the ability, when you move a unit from occupied to vacant, to throw it into a vacant status. And so a whole list of automations takes over. If you have trades that come in, uh, during a turnover, and they like to open the windows and turn the thermostat down, right? They got to have the paint dry, so they open the windows. They want it to be cold while they're in there working, so they turn it down to 60. You can actually set notifications to say, is the window open and is the AC down at 60? And, and somebody on site can get that notification, or you can set rules that say, when a unit is vacant, I want the thermostat to go no lower than 72. So no matter what the trades do while they're in there, the thermostat stays at a certain set point. Um, it, it also works in an occupied status. And one of the things that, uh, I, I love the vidyard example that you gave earlier, but things are still gonna break, right? So if an AC unit is not working, that's gotta be a number one, that's, as a homeowner, that's my number one most frustrating call is I need it to work immediately. I live in South Texas. Uh, we, we've already hit 100 this year. I, climate change, right? So uh, we're, we're already experiencing that if my AC went out, I would have somebody at my house in an hour. I would find anyone that was available to come out there and do it. From an AC perspective, uh, one of the coolest things about this technology is every technician, uh, every on-site maintenance staff now has the thermostat on their phone for every unit. So if they are historically going up to a unit and saying, okay, they said the AC is not working, so I'm gonna walk up the three flights of stairs, turn the AC on, walk back down to where the AC unit is, see if the fan kicked on, walk back upstairs, turn the AC off, come back downstairs, see if the fan turned off to try and diagnose everything. Now they go straight to the unit, they pop open their phone, they turn the AC on, watch the unit to see what's happening, they turn the AC off, watch the unit to see what's happening. Uh, huge time savings there from a uh, just overall man hours perspective. And then lastly, leak detection is something that I think is on the rise in multifamily from an insurance perspective. Huge discounts uh, are on the way because that's, I think the number one claim right now is not fire damage anymore, it's uh, water damage. And it okay. comes from leaks in some of these properties. So from a leak perspective, uh, we have early detection from little sensors that actually go underneath vanities, behind washer-dryer connections, uh, in hot water AC drip pans, where the minute a leak is identified, the resident gets a notification, the property manager gets a notification, the head of maintenance, whoever you want on that notification string gets a notification that there's a leak that's been detected. And we're even moving into uh, 
uh, water metering, where you can actually check the, the flow of water into units. You can find out, hey, is something constantly running water? So that takes the leaky toilets out of the situation, not just leaks that lead to water damage, but also leaks that lead to additional costs. Sure. So huge, huge driver. Smart technology is driving down operational costs in that aspect, and it's just interesting. Uh, wasn't the necessarily the first angle that we took with our marketing efforts, but the customers that we brought on board, uh, like BH while Taylor was there, said, we've saved money using this product. And, and the clearest example of that was a property that had leak detectors scheduled to be installed. The leak they had the week before we got there, they said the damage from that, the cost that they paid, would have paid for the entire installation, not just for that one unit, uh, for the entire property, had they had the leaks installed a week sooner and and been able to mitigate that risk. So uh, insurance discounts are another cost savings with insurance companies realizing how much damage water costs. Uh, these products also lead to uh, insurance discounts. What kind of average are you seeing on the insurance discounts? The average is probably, uh, it's, it's low, it's three to five percent, but when you add additional risk mitigating uh, tools into your portfolio, the insurance discount can add up and add up and add up. So. Gotcha. All right, fantastic, thank you. So as we talked about reducing costs and increasing efficiency, you kind of hinted at that there's these other opportunities, particularly with using technology to be able to drive more revenue. Because saving money is, is two sides of the equation. Right? And that if we can reduce costs, that's one way that we can increase our profit. But we can also increase our profit by getting more revenue. And with service and maintenance, surprisingly enough, as we were talking beforehand, there are some good examples of how technology allows us to be able to get more people to come, increase our occupancy, increase revenue, and actually influence the other side of the equation. It's kind of the, the opposite of what we might expect with service and maintenance. So, Carol, can you tell us a little bit about the advantages that you've seen on that side of the house? And I think you kind of alluded to some of them already, that having this uh, really modern setup is attracting a lot of people to come to your properties. Can you talk about um, what other technology you've seen to, to get people to come and get more beds and heads? <laughs> Heads and beds. <laughs> yes, that too. Um, yeah, so, you know, not only by having our standard, you know, Yardi CRM and everything for our, our day-to-day to, day -to -day and using the Nexodus co-working software, um, you know, we also have gamification in-house. And this isn't anything really too new in multifamily, but it really, I just don't think, like, some properties that I've seen across the country or other peers that I've spoken with, like, that they're really using it to learn about what the residents want and the feedback that they're given. Um, is this where we're showing the polls? Yes. Um, so I actually ran a poll for the last month for you guys. Um, and the question was, and I did this at my Chicago properties, um, which there's three of those um, in downtown Chicago. I also did it in Nashville and Phoenix. And this is something tangible from the people real time that you guys can take back as developers um, or work with your companies of like, this is what's most important to people when making their housing decision. Um, and this was ran from April 12th to just May 9th. Um, so the next slide, um, and this is from, multi, from Modern Message, which is our gamification platform. So this is a platform where uh, people can complete actions to earn points to cash in for gift cards or Uber rides. Uh, Modern Message Community Rewards partners with so many different worldwide vendors. Um, we all love to cash in and do things. So we can get reviews. They get points for that. They can RSVP, RSVP for yoga class. They can attend an event for points. Um, they can upload community pictures, and then they each like their little pictures, and then they get points for liking each other's pictures. So anyway, it's just like a, a rewards program that we all, if you travel like I do, like I live and die by my miles and my status. Like I'll complete a Delta survey for 500 miles. So we do this as well. Um, okay, so Nashville, um, what's the most important thing when making your housing decision? So some demographics I pulled where um, the birth year is typically 1986. Average income per month was around 10000 and as you can see, a majority female. Um, but, um, yeah, so um, the most important thing, as you can see, was location to work or school. So when people are zoning in on your location, um, that's what's really driving people. And I just got back from the Huntington AIM conference in Huntington Beach, and we learned with G5 and Lease Labs that 
people are actually only touring two to three properties. And we're over here obsessed with like 10 of our competitors, right? What's everybody doing? What's everybody doing? But people are really zoning in on two to three properties and making their decision from that. But there's 32 touch points now. Isn't that incredible? 32 steps for someone to make a decision. So they're going to your Google business, reviews, social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, website, looking at your floor plans. So, I mean, and then by the time it's like buying a car, you already know what you want, right? So as you can see here, it's like location to work or school, but right behind there is your price and amenities and then safety and security, um, which was right up there as well. And I think this really ties into what you're saying is because in different cities, especially with people moving from different parts of the world or country, it's really important for safety and security. And it's something that we have to invest in and that I think is really important to our demographic. Um, next one is Phoenix. So average um, birth year is 1985. Average income per month, 13,100. Um, and a little bit more, more males there in Phoenix. Um, and as you can see, again, location. We're right downtown. Um, and then right up there, 29% was safety. Um, so that's really, really important. And it just drives home having that technology, having your access controls, um, your you know, easy access to your apartments, how you're screening people, camera security. Um, this is what people are saying. And then um, last but not least is Chicago River North. Um, and this is average uh, 15,075, 735 average income per month. Average birth year 1990, which I actually thought this property would have a little bit older people. Um, and a majority female. And safety was number one. And of course, this is in River North Chicago in a really nice neighborhood. Um, and it's a small boutique property. Um, and then if you go to um, the next one, is um, this is in River West, kind of right over the river there. About even with male and female, um, average birth year again, 1990. And most important thing was price and amenities to these people um, and location. Sorry, they don't really care about safety, but <laughs> you, would, you would think so in Chicago. Um, but again, this was a really, it's a small property, um, so not a ton of engagement there. Um, but, you know, price point is, is really important too. And I've seen a kind of theme throughout this conference is that you really want to be transparent about your pricing, your online um, accurate information, because people are going to go throughout those 32 steps and then make their decision quickly. Fantastic. So heads and beds. Um, we have another video here. You want to walk us through um, what we're about to see in this video. Hey Adam, it's Melissa. Thank you so much for coming in and talking with me and Alex today. I just wanted to show you this, this office space. Using one more time yard, just to remember what and walking you need over here at the Like I said, we do have the and building that face to face well connection with somebody they just met. And they're kind of more leaning towards, but I want to show you right. this space as well as the other office space that have that back office. So, so yeah. So with, with the Vidyard capability, and we have um, our open co-working spaces, this is a really big office. This is going for about 10 grand a month. Um, so it's something that we really want to show people um, for larger companies. And you can literally just walk through it. People can see the light. They can meet Melissa. They know who's going to be taking care of them. And, she, and we close that office space. So um, the, the teams are really getting used to this because they're seeing their commissions <laughs> coming through. And they're like, let me send a video and close this um, quicker versus just somebody getting a diagram and, and having to figure it out. So video all the way. Awesome. Okay, Taylor, we've, we've left you sitting here for a no, while. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> no, this, this is fine. This no, is, this is I like plan. to take it in. But, but tell <laughs> us a bit about, from your viewpoint, working with both vendors and working with, with clients. Um, when we talked previously, you mentioned how the, the internet is really the backbone to be able to enable all this. Can you expand upon that and, and give any additional thoughts about what we've heard so far? Yeah. So to kind of talk about the backbone statement. So as, uh, as time goes on, you guys are noticing your residents are demanding more and more technology. And I think uh, really Carol summarized excellently. Uh, there's a lot of different needs for different residents. Not every resident's the same. It's not cookie cutter. It's not one size fits all. Um, and I think, you know, owner operators each individually have their own goals um, and really are pursuing different things, whether that's they're struggling with too many uh, maintenance requests. So maybe they would be interested in a platform like Vidyard um, that kind of kind of help them reduce that. But uh, honestly, every every owner has some sort of pain point that they're trying to solve. Uh, so really, there is a prop tech solution that you can implement, such as smart home technology, such as Vidyard, such as uh, package lockers, whatever it is that, uh, again, you guys are struggling with. 
um, to help kind of free some bandwidth up. But really, in the future, you guys are recognizing that access control is really a very important segment. Um, I like to call it uh, curb to couch, just because there's so much uh, Economy, they call it the sharing economy nowadays with the younger generation. And there's, you know, everybody wants to order out food. So they want, you know, when they, once they place that order, they don't want to have to go down to the front of the gate of the community to meet that person with their food because they didn't just spend $40 in fees with DoorDash <laughs> to get that food uh, to have to walk downstairs. Uh, guilty. But uh, I will say that access control um, is also a critical component of self touring, self showing. Um, and really, you know, you look at the uh, operational backbone of the, the HVAC analytics, you look at um, all the operational issues within a unit that can occur, such as, you know, mold with high humidity or frozen pipes bursting. So you have leak detection capabilities if you're in a state that, uh, like Colorado, I spend a lot of time there throughout the year. And I can tell you that uh, one of my clients up there has a significant issue with frozen pipes because the residents will leave on vacation. Uh, and forget to leave the heat on. So, you know, by implementing certain technologies, they were able to solve that. But it really comes down to one solid backbone, and that IoT uh, is the backbone of the future of multifamily living in every capacity that exists. Um, it can be integrated with property management systems. It can be integrated with uh, you know, your package locker system, your access control, package delivery, everything that a resident will need moving into the future so I believe it's very important to make sure you understand what your goals are and ultimately make sure that you're not wasting time looking at a technology that's not actually going to help you solve that goal, but instead is just kind of shiny and the cool thing that everybody said you should do. Um, so that's, that's kind of my thoughts on it. So, so I think that's a good, good transition into the next topic is that technology tends to be just the shiny, really cool Eventually, someone within the company says, I want to see the numbers. I want to see the data. I want to see how it's going to impact the bottom line. Exactly. So as you're working with the vendors and working with the clients, what, how do you capture that data? How are you helping them use that data to, to not only justify a decision up front, but then also once you've started deploying to be able to give some confidence that, hey, we made the right decision and we're actually seeing the benefits of, of our investment? Absolutely, great question. So, uh, you know, I kind of started about the goals or mentioned about the goals. I think that's really the most important component when you go into anything, is really make sure that you clearly define what you're pursuing. So we like to say that uh, we're like the VIP chauffeur that you see in a theme park. Uh, you, you know, you kind of build a relationship with that person. They take you around to the rides that they feel you're gonna best be um, enjoyed, uh, I would say. but. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's having somebody that can understand what your unique needs are and can get you to the right ride or the right prop tech solution in this case to make sure that you're not wasting time standing in line just to get on another ride that's you know, going to be totally off base what you're trying to accomplish. So I think having somebody that really can understand the intricacies such as you know, key management, reduced energy usage, vacant unit management, maintenance staff savings, uh, leasing staff savings, liabilities and risks associated with everything on the property. Um, you're also wanting to take into consideration revenue generation. How is this gonna increase the bottom line? Does this increase the valuation of your community? Um, and ultimately, is this going to allow us to achieve our cash flow goals? So we take all those things in mind um, and really we actually built our own solution to help translate that value. Just because we understand so many owners, in order to make a decision, they need data. And the best way to get data is to run a pilot or it has been in the past. So. Just to run a pilot with one vendor is a significant investment, not only in time, energy, and effort, but when you think about, okay, there's, I mean, smart home. What did you say yesterday? There's 11 vendors in the space right now? That are here. That, okay, sorry, <laughs> that, that are here. My bad. That's my point, right? Thank you very much. So, you know, you think, okay, I hear, I'm at a conference, I hear smart home is what I need to be focused on, and then you just kind of start from scratch. Well, you don't have to start from scratch. You can kind of give some, uh, if you know where your community's at, such as zip code, if you know how many units there are, and you can tell me, you know, kind of between garden style, mid-rise, high-rise, walk-up, whatever the build type is and whatever the asset class is, we pull cap rates from the market itself, we pull uh, vacancy data from the market itself, we pull um, via our integration with labor statistics, we're able to give efficiencies on time. So, you know, most people, I'll give you the example, the washing machine video you just showed us. So, in a workday, you typically get eight hours of 
pay, or I should say you should pay your employees for eight hours. However, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is really, uh, they establish only 60% of that workday converts to usable hours on the job. Um, and a lot of that is because there's so much transition involved between jobs. There's so much uh, having to understand all the little mini minuscule things just to kind of switch, uh, you know, mindsets. So I think being able to understand exactly what the goals are, being able to see before you pilot what the financial repercussions are going to be from implementing a technology. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily give you exactly the snapshot, but within a 5% variance, and it can save you nine months, there's a pretty big amount of revenue that you can make if you take that jump. Um, so it's just you know less time wasted at the end of the day. So, so it sounds like you could help companies that are deploying something like Vidyard be able to take the, the view counts for different videos and then to be able to quantify and say, because of the number of times these videos are viewed, this is how much savings you, you, know, you can potentially capitalize on in employment costs. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely, and that's where our market data really comes into shine, because every market has different costs for that labor. So if we understand where the community's at and we understand how the technology really uh, impacts the operational capacity of your community, we can actually give within that 5% variance of exactly how operationally, from a time savings perspective, you're going to benefit. Hmm. Yeah, a little bit of a, a side tangent here. It's been really interesting to see as we talked about the, the pandemic and how it's impacted a lot of industries. Just looking at the hotel industry has been fascinating to see how they have changed, you know, who's working at the front desk, how available they are, I, when I was in Vegas a, a couple months ago for a conference, you know, I, I went to a, a pretty well-known hotel that normally you wouldn't have expected that particular brand to have an app, but they had an app this time. I was able to check in beforehand, and I'm glad that I did. And I had to, I had to upload like my driver's license, a few things, the things you normally would have to give at the door, but I went ahead and did that because I had some time in the Uber on the way over, and I'm sure glad I did because you could tell where they used to probably have like 10 people working in the front desk, they probably had two people working in the front desk, and there was a line just backed up where they were really forcing people to use the technology. But it has to be because they've done this type of analysis and say, if we can train, retrain our customers to use the technology, we have a vast amount of savings. And I, I don't want to knock the, the Marriott brand. I'm a, a, a gold lifetime member, but I'm still waiting for them to reopen the club. You know, and, and while most locations don't have the club open yet, begin because I'm sure they've been looking at the data and saying, well, in the last two years, we've been able to see all these additional efficiencies because we haven't had to set out food for three meals a day that you know, five business people will kind of graze through. Right? <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Marshall, as, you, as you're working with your clients, either ones that are looking to, to come on board for you or ones that are already on board, what are some of the data that you're helping share with them to help make their decision, confirm their decision, and to make additional business decisions in the future? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I went to a well-known uh, Las Vegas hotel brand as well, and I... Not, I didn't download everything in the car. I didn't try and do They sent lots of messaging about how you should do that. When I got there, though, to the lobby, uh, and I saw the line, I downloaded the app right away. <laughs> I put all my information. And I stood in line with everyone because I didn't know if the app experience would meet the expectations that I had. So I'm sitting there downloading the information thinking I'm still going to have to wait through these 50 people to get up to the front of the line. And uh, as I'm doing it, I'm telling people in line, you know, you can download this. And, and you can go straight to your room. And when I finished it, maybe two people had been helped, and I got out of line and went straight up to my room, and it worked great. So And, and use your phone as a yep. key to open the door. Absolutely. Yep. So that's where a lot of the data that uh, our customers are tracking is coming in right now, is how many people do we really need to do these jobs? No. Uh, a big piece that we're seeing a uh, shift in right now is the amount of leasing staff. Uh, and won't go into details on, on maintenance or anything like that, but if we just look at leasing, an interesting concept with self-guided tours is uh, some of our customers have implemented self-guided tours. It, it, uh, if there's one thing we can be thankful for during the pandemic, right, it was the rapid adoption of certain technologies. Uh, as, a, as a supplier, that's one thing I can be thankful for, right? It's not necessarily <laughs> something that you guys were all thankful that you got to spend extra money on during the pandemic. But um, when you look at the adoption of smart home and how it 
was just repurposed, right? The smart lock always opened the door, the smart thermostat always controlled the thermostat, the smart light switch always turned lights on and off. But during the pandemic, it became, this is how we can show somebody our apartment without being there in front of them. Uh, and it, it was just repurposing the benefits. The, the features were always there, the benefit statement just changed. Well, as folks started to do that, uh, an interesting thing that happened was they said, if we can show people apartments, without someone taking them to the apartment, is that a task that we need a leasing agent to do at this point? So uh, <laughs> leasing agents uh, across the country are probably thinking right now, how's my job going to change? It's, we're not gonna get rid of leasing agents, right? There's still an important piece to every yes. uh, property management company, but how is my job gonna change? What am I gonna be doing differently? Am I gonna be filming Vidyard videos on how to use our business space? Am I gonna be upselling uh, really cool new features that are a part of the community that I work in. Um, some of our clients have started to really analyze the data behind uh, what they're doing with self-guided tours. So when we talk about data and we talk about all the, the stuff that's being crunched in the back, uh, we have a client based out of San Antonio who is now taking their self-guided tours and they've added uh, video to their, uh, their unoccupied units um, with audio uh, and it's, it's stated outside the unit before you get in there, you're, you are being recorded, we can hear what you're saying. So they know whenever they go to these uh, walkthroughs, so they've added QR codes on the floor in each room. When you get to the room, instead of a leasing agent being in there, you can scan a QR code and an audio file pops up that says, well, to welcome to our community, we're excited to have you here. And it talks about the benefits of the floor plan that they're in, it talks about the community itself, it talks about what attractions are close by. And they started to take some of that backend data and say, okay, when someone takes a look at an apartment and they spend more than 11 minutes in the kitchen area talking with their significant other or, or just in this area, we are, our close rate on that lease is above 50%. When they spend less than five minutes in the bedroom, our close rate is less than 25%. They're starting to take a look at what the, the trends are saying and so they find more and more creative ways to keep people in those areas because they know if we can get them in here and if they will stay in this area, we're more likely to close the lease. Uh, what is that doing to the headcount, to the manpower, to the, the hours that go into something like this? What is the data telling them? Uh, for this customer, it's telling them they can centralize leasing. They can have a group yes. of leasing agents who now work in one location rather than having two leasing agents at every, every single property. property. Yeah. Uh, and that leasing agent can use technology like Vidyard, like FaceTime, like Zoom. And when the lease is, com or when the, the self-guided tour is complete, that leasing agent gets a notification that the front door was just locked, the tour is over. They can call that person right then. Hey, how did you like the tour? What did you think? Uh, what questions do you have about this? For some of our clients, we've even, uh, through integrations with the property management software, been able to send push notifications through text to the resident, uh, the, the prospective resident, when the tour ends uh, through their leasing program. So they get a pre-leasing agreement. So the minute the, the door locks, that triggers a notification and they get a pre-leasing agreement. Hey, did you like what you saw? Would you like to fill out this application? Would you like to, to continue down the process? So it's interesting uh, how our customers are using data. And it's, uh, again, Smart Home has been around uh, we have a Kahoot quiz for those of you who are jumping into one of our boardrooms. So I won't tell you what, uh, I can tell you, it was like, like 1965 was the first smart home product that came out. And it's interesting to see the evolution of it. It was always just about making things simpler. Uh, and the data's always been there. But our customers are the ones telling us how they're using the data now to inform broader decisions on what they do with headcount, what they do with staffing, what they do with maintenance and how it all works. So it's just, it's been fantastic to watch uh, and it changes the value proposition of what we do every day. It, it's been fascinating. I hope that each of you in your companies is taking the opportunity over the last two years, the pandemic has is, is forced us to reconsider how are we doing what we're doing and, and can we be doing this differently? And if you, if you feel like, oh, it's, it's all over, we can just go back to what we were doing before, I think you're making a mistake. Yeah. Is that there, there's absolutely been eye-opening um, discoveries, not just in this industry. You know, I, I teach at Kansas State University, teaching 
particular higher education has gone through a, a big awakening as well, where it feels like you know we've opened up this Pandora's box when it comes to learning via Zoom, and and a lot of administrators are like, oh no, we got to get them back into the classes. They got to be back in the classes, and you know it's it's not going to happen. I mean, students are going to vote with their feet. We see the same thing in the workforce, where for decades, people were saying, I could do my job from home. You just don't trust me to do that. And then we were forced to have to do our work from home. And we found out we could get stuff done, we get the job done, and have all this extra time and not have to commute and have flexibility to, to be with our family. And now the companies are trying to pull us back in. The companies that are still saying, hey, no, we're cool with this, they're getting the employees, the 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 businesses that are not being flexible and are trying to, to people I think are losing employees, there are lessons to be learned there that apply to this industry that if you're not willing to adapt to what kind of the new mindset is, you're gonna, your competitors are, and they're going to, to get those residents. And just to piggyback on that while it's on my head, on my brain, is that you know with our co-working space and these small tech companies and even large tech companies that are, you know, normally based in Silicon Valley or Washington or Portland, um, you know, they can move into these different cities. You know, Nashville has no income tax. That's why everybody's moving there. Um, and so their tech, their companies are actually paying for their co-working space. And when I speak to people, you know, because I'm always at the coffee bars talking to everybody, and they're like, I love that I can work from home, but not from home. And, you know, when people are renting a new apartment or, um, or moving to a new city, they still want to meet people. And so by being able to have like a, a, a social space a, a, and a space that you can monetize on, people are happy to pay for that. And um, our, our co-working spaces are just doing phenomenal. And it's, it's really exciting to see um, that our um, four desk office pods, you know, for four grand a month are being rented. And for long term, um, we also do flexible rental spaces as well in the co-working. But just to hammer your point is that with people being able to work all over and being able to be flexible with where they want to work and still be productive, it's great to have that co-working or social space on your properties um, that you can also monetize on. And I have to expect, this is kind of, again, going further down the road, is that this is opening up for many of you, I imagine, opportunities in smaller markets that you probably did not anticipate that you would have opportunities in two or three years ago. That now that there are so many industries and companies that are allowing remote work, you have people that are willing to go to the Midwest or go to places where the cost of living is much cheaper. And as long as they've got rock-solid internet yep. and I've got a great place to live, you know, my work can, can take place everywhere, which I, I think is going to mm -hmm. continue to open up opportunities. But we're, we're just kind of hitting our 10-minute our mark here, so oh, I'm, I'm going to open it up to you as an audience. What are some questions you might have for our panelists here, or some just observations that, that have come to mind as you've been listening today? And raise your hand. We've got a microphone passed around. Go ahead. Yeah, with the Connect brand, is your, view, your future view that people can sign like short-term or flexible leases to move between the properties? Is that kind of? Yeah, so um, in Phoenix right now, we're allowed to do as little as 60-day leases, which we already are. So we are surrounded by four different hospitals. So we are just the, the, the hub for traveling nurses. And with the furnished apartments, the word has spread so quickly. And now we added a significant premium, um, but people are willing to pay that because they're not obligated for a long time. And what we've also found is that they're there for six for for an SGR for like you know 60 days, 90 days, and then their contract gets extended, or they need just a couple more months. And so we go on month to month for a higher premium, but it's still cheaper than getting an Airbnb or having to move and pay new fees, um, which most people don't do short-term rentals. Um, that's a whole other panel we could just talk about. It's like yeah. STR, you know. Um, and we are we are monetizing on that, and we have no problem. People do not you know debate us on paying the premiums for that. Now, Nashville has different local laws. We can do as little as 90 days. Um, so we um, do a 90-day lease, but we just opened up a whole floor that we're calling it our STR floor. Um, it's 30-day rentals. Um, it's fully outfitted. We hired a company called Front Desk, um, and it's fully outfitted with bring your toothbrush. So linens, consumables, edibles, um, not the edibles, edibles like you have in Colorado. Uh, <laughs> we all uh, you know, it. Like Don't lie. Your uh, coffee, hair dryer, just like we have in our hotel room. It's a hotel room. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, basically it's a, a hotel floor. Room. It's hotel rooms. Yeah, and so um, this product really feels like a hotel-like, and we have the hospitality services with it. So to answer your question, 
Absolutely. We've jumped on the STR wagon for since the beginning. So, so here's the crazy. We were talking about this beforehand. Because they've set up this infrastructure to be able to have this 11th floor as a hotel, and, and you've got someone working the front desk and doing some of the amenities with that, they're preparing their way that they can, with all the other floors, have someone who's a working professional who may be gone Tuesday through Friday to be able to convert their room, their apartment, yes. into an Airbnb for those days that they're gone, that the process is being handled through the website that yep. is already set up to be able to check out the rooms on the 11th floor. We're just now going to add these other rooms into that product mix. It's, it's yeah, we're getting our processes in and figure out what the hell we're doing too. So um, that's why we hired, we just have <clears throat> one floor right now, but eventually with, I mean, we have five business models. So um, part of the Connect brand is having this hoteling option where, you know, our demographic is 25 to 45 years old. And this is the most in-debt generation ever, but it's the most expensive lifestyle, right? So if you, your biggest <laughs> payment per month is your mortgage or your rent. So if you could take that away and put it back into your business, pay off student loans, get more technology, then, you know, you could just skyrocket. So that's what we're really honing in on. So eventually, yes, we want to open this up to our residents with a 12-month lease where you could be able to hotel your room for up to 180 days a year. But there's a fee, there's a profit share here because we're going to handle all the communication, all the cleaning. You're not going to have to talk to somebody that's locked out at 2 a.m. while you're on a work trip. Like, it's all in-house. And that's why 80% of our product is now furnished because they're going to get the Connect brand experience when they come in. So they can attend a fitness class. Oh, there's a networking event going on tonight. Oh, there's a rooftop pool party. Um, so it's a whole experience, too, um, for those Airbnb people. Um, but we are figuring it out. But we have our hoteling floor right now. So in Phoenix, if anybody wants to stay there for the next conference, let me know. <laughs> the, their location in Phoenix is two blocks away from where we'll be holding this conference. Yeah. And we were talking prior to this meeting, like, we need to make sure to find a way to, to get we over there. We need to do, there, like, so. a rooftop happy hour for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Insights, thoughts, feedback. <laughs> so, with the few minutes that we have left here, and if you have another question, raise your hand. JP will find you. As we look out into the future, and as we look at maintenance, what other technologies do you think are are either just starting to get some traction or that you expect will be able to get traction in the next, say, three-year horizon? I'll Who wants it. to go, go first? Go ahead. I've been talking the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more, more than emerging technology, I think, uh, if I go back to the, the point that I made earlier and what I'm hearing directly from owners, operators, developers is that the labor landscape continues to change. So I, I think the technology itself uh, needs to continue to be integrated, uh, needs to work well in, in whatever ecosystem you've created. But I think the labor uh, pool really starts to change where some of these management companies, some of the folks that are, are traditionally hiring the same uh, skill set for leasing, the same skill set for property management, the same skill set for maintenance, are going to have to start hiring data analysts who are taking a look at all the data that's coming in and, and redesigning the way the company operates. I think as more and more of these functions that were always property specific get more centralized uh, and leasing becomes centralized, maintenance, uh, what we're talking about here, even becomes centralized, centralized yeah. where you have, number one, really cool technology videos that show you how to fix it yourself. Uh, rather than waiting for a maintenance guy to come, but also a, a roaming maintenance person now. There's not somebody on site everywhere. It's somebody who gets calls in on, on stuff that was beyond fix it yourself, uh, and now that one person is paid at a, at a rate one and a half times what a normal maintenance guy was, but he's got four properties within a, a certain radius that he's going to now uh, and spending time only on each property to handle the stuff that really needs to be fixed. Uh, so I, I really see data continuing to drive employment uh, and, and labor, and that's the thing that I think is the most intriguing about how technology is changing. And it's not getting rid of jobs. It's changing what people are doing in their jobs. Uh, and that leasing agent that you're hiring 
five years ago is not the leasing agent you're going to hire for the next five years. It's, yeah. You've got to get somebody way more in tune with technology. A natural extension <laughs> of that centralization is that we will likely see a lot of companies, instead of perhaps having a property in each major market, it would make more sense to try to own a particular market and get increased density and property within that market so that you can have a leasing agent that can still get to all my properties within a half an hour, an hour, my maintenance supervisor that again can get to all the properties half an hour, because that's where you're gonna be able to get those economies of scale is, is through centralization, but still accessibility of my key people to, to my various properties. And, and that's the important thing that, that I'm hearing from, I, I do a lot of these panels across the country, uh, and the important thing that I hear is, yes, this 25 to 45 is a, a new demographic, they have new asks, they want single app, single button, let me push something and, and somebody shows up with my Uber, uh, my Uber Eats, my whatever it is, however, a lot of people, and I, I, I'm an old millennial, right? I'm at the, the cusp of Gen X and millennial there. I still want a human being to talk to. I don't want uh, all buttons, all technology, you know, all internet-based. I want to talk to somebody. So you have to be able to meet the demands of uh, each half of that spectrum. Yeah, and I think it is split. Just, just by show of hands, even in this room, between the two options of I want to talk to a person versus I want an app that will do that for me. I just kind of want to see by show of hands. How many of you, I, I want to talk to people, okay? How many of you are, I want the app? Yeah. I know, I'm like this. <laughs> I, I want the app first, <laughs> but the app doesn't yeah. work. I want to talk to a person, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, so, it, and it was split. You see that yeah. in the room, is that you, you have to be able to address all those channels. That's why going back to, you know, people going through 32 steps and making sure just everything is cohesive online throughout all your channels um, and, you know, using TikTok. I mean, let's just put it on the table here. It's, it's here. And yes, that thing that your 16-year-old is doing, um, this is going to quickly become an information outlet and it's free um, very quickly. I mean, I know maintenance guys, I mean, they watch TikToks to figure out how to fix things, you yeah. know. Um, it's kind of the new YouTube. So using this as a free, even for brand awareness and for developments and showing off your properties for quick information, um, TikTok is definitely an outlet because people are watching. That makes sense. I was going to say, and kind of to, to <laughs> bring it all together here, I think one thing to keep in mind is good technology you typically won't recognize is there. And if you do, it's typically not good technology, right? That's why you don't want 14 apps for your resident. That's why you want one. That's why you, know, you don't want to implement a system that's going to add things to your leasing agent's plate. You want things that take things off their plate. So if, uh, you know, if you're considering a solution, I would just say make sure that it works within your pre-existing ecosystem um, because there's too many point-based prop tech companies that say, hey, we do this one thing really, really well, and it's going to do X, Y, Z. But at the end of the day, if that's not something that plays well with your ecosystem, then it's going to be a waste of time, energy, and effort. So um, good technology, I've always really lived by that, is, is something that you do not realize is there. Um, and really, like, you, you load a website, for instance, um, you only realize websites are slow when they don't load, of course. <laughs> you know, but most time, you go to a website and it doesn't even occur to you how fast a website is loading. You just know you click the button and the website's loaded. So when things start to uh, prohibit your ability to do things that you're trying to accomplish, that's bad technology. Um, and I think one thing to keep in mind as well, not only do you want something that's not going to get in the way, but you also want something that's future-proof because there are too many brands and too many technologies today, especially with all the funding that's in prop tech right now. I've seen just since 2017, since I've been in the multifamily industry, I have seen more companies come and go than I can count. And I can tell you that I have met several multifamily owner operators that have been left holding the bag with solutions that went out of business and now they've spent all this money and they're trying to figure out, well, well, what do we do now? Because Vivint's no longer in multifamily. We have their thermostat, and we have their lock, and we have this, and we have to completely you know, re-retrofit our entire community because we decided that Vivint was cool, even though it didn't integrate with anything well, even though it wasn't you know, agnostic and allow us to uh, 
you know, to expand. You need to think about what's coming after your community. Over the next 50 years, who's going to own that community in five years? Who's going to own it in 10 years? Have they made the same technology decisions that you've made? So um, I would say definitely focus on uh, you know, making sure that you're going to be able to achieve your goals with as little headache as possible. All right. Please join me in a round of applause for Taylor, for Carol, for Marshall.